It's my absolute pleasure. Are you recording? I am recording. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just have to restart that again. Okay, sure, sure. So, hello, welcome everyone. My name is Edson. I'm a pharmacist uh, who's been doing, who's involved in diabetes education. And uh, this is, will be a series of presentations that we, we will be doing to help you prepare for the exam. Yeah, and I want to thank Veronica for sponsoring this event. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Yeah. So, how's everybody studying going? <laughs> There's some nervous glares. That's not that's not a good time. The, the good news is, is that you know you've still got a lot of time. You should start studying now. Again, the most important document is the Canadian Practice Guidelines, the 2018 version. And so um, you should be trying to go through the chapters. That's the most important uh, important document to read. And uh, yeah. This is meant to be a very casual presentation. If you have any questions at any time, feel free to raise your hand. I'm here to help you guys out in whatever way I can. I do have some people uh, online and they might be asking questions too. So sometimes I might be looking at the computer, I'm just seeing if they're asking me questions. Yeah. And then this, these, uh, this presentation is being recorded and I'm, I'm going to upload it onto my website. So you know, if you're some dark secret, don't share with the rest of the crowd, okay? <laughs> okay, so today we're going to talk about basal insulin. And it's basal, basal insulin and insulin in general is really important for the exam. There we go. Uh, this program is being sponsored by Sanofi and Veronica, and I received honorarium from the following people. So we're going to we're going to review the pathophysiology of diabetes. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a recap from last presentation. We're going to talk about the role of basal insulin, uh, the kind of obstacles that you guys face in your day-to-day -day practice when trying to start people on insulin, as well as do a little bit of a review of insulin technique. So on your exam handbook, at the very end, I think it's one, one of the appendixes, you'll see your list of competencies. Again, just like I chatted about before, the 1A competencies will work for most marks, and then 2A, no, 1A, 1B, 2A, and then 2B. So, you know, if you're kind of cramming for your exam, focus on the 1, 1A and 1B competencies first. Yeah. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about these two competencies for the exam, okay? Okay, so just a recap of the last presentation. Remember that diabetes is a metabolic disorder. There's either a problem with insulin secretion, insulin action, or a combination of both, okay? So let's begin with a question right off the bat. Take your time. I want to my water. <laughs> okay, I want full participation this time, okay? We're all here to learn, don't judge other people, okay? Okay, so who says A first? How about B? C? And D? Very good. So yeah, so with type 1 diabetes, we're not exactly sure what triggers it in the first place. Uh, for some reason, people with type 1 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, their immune system will attack their own pancreas, destroying their own beta cells, and then without beta cells, you don't have any insulin production. So really, type 1 diabetes is mostly a, a problem with defective insulin secretion. They're not producing any insulin, so they, they have diabetes. So, because we don't know what, cause, what causes it, we think that maybe it's due to a virus, or we might think it's due to genetic factors. People who live nor more north of the equator tend to have higher levels of type 1 diabetes than those who live closer to the equator. So there's some sort of environmental aspect that we don't understand as well. Mm -hmm. So lots of stuff we don't understand. So that's why there's no real effective prevention of it, because we don't understand what causes it in the first place. That's very different from type 2 diabetes. Uh, with type 2 diabetes, often there's a problem with insulin secretion in that there's beta cell dysfunction. But usually, most, most people with di type 2 diabetes are obese as well. So weight is associated with insulin resistance, and so they have a combination of both problems. Yeah, so usually type 2 diabetes is kind of in this, this, act, this area here. Okay, 
Um, yeah, and high dose, they did do research in the prevent, should try to prevent type 1 diabetes. Uh, nicotinamide had no effect. Low dose, uh, high dose metformin or low dose metformin is ineffective with type 1. That's usually used for type 2. And the low doses of insulin had a small effect in a small subgroup, but overall it had no effect when compared to the general population. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Remember, say, feel free to ask questions at any time, okay? So, beta cell dysfunction in type 1 diabetes mostly occurs during adolescence for some reason. Uh, there's a honeymoon period where People can have, people with type 1 diabetes have a little bit of insulin production, so they can use very, very small amounts of insulin, but eventually that will, their immune system will take over, destroy the rest of the beta cells, and then they'll be fully dependent on uh, insulin adaptogens. But this can occur at any age. Like this, this type 1 diabetes usually happens in adolescence, but it doesn't have to. There's been case reports of people getting type 1 diabetes even in. Uh, eight decade, eight decade of life. So when they turn eighty, they they're diagnosed with type one diabetes. So usually it's adolescence, but it doesn't have to be. There's also very young kids who have type one diabetes as well. They get it when they're like six months or twelve months, and then you have to give like a six month year old like insulin right away. Does anybody have experience with that? Like low di type one diabetes at very old or very young ages? Huh? Just relatives. Just relatives? Okay. And when, if I may ask, when did they get started? Uh, two years old for one. And two other. years old? Okay, mm -hmm. that's quite young. Mm -hmm. And then the other two were like 10, 8 and 10. 8 and 10? Okay. okay. Type, one, type 1 diabetes is also, like, so type 1 diabetes is a problem with, of autoimmunity. Your own immune system is attacking your pancreas. It's not supposed to. It thinks that the pancreas is some bad guy or virus or something like that. That's why it's beating it up. Uh, but often people with type 1 diabetes will have other kind of autoimmune diseases as well. So, no. Okay. Okay, so it's difficult to diagnose type 1 diabetes, but often they'll have antibodies to insulin and antibodies to beta cells. So most most people will test positive for one of these kind of antibodies because these are the antibodies that are attacking the attacking the pancreas and the insulin. You can also use it to determine risk in relatives. If uh, you know, for example, for if you said your cousins had, yeah. So for your kids, you could actually do this kind of test to see, and if they have high levels, then they they may be at higher risk for type one diabetes as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So beta cell dysfunction type two diabetes is very different. Uh, with type one, usually it's quite sudden. Uh, the immune, your immune, your the immune system attacks the beta cells, and those cells get destroyed pretty quickly. With type two, it's it's quite different. Uh, Beta cell dysfunction can occur very early. Sometimes, some studies say that that beta cell dysfunction can occur up to a decade before actual diagnosis. So usually, it's a usually it's a slow, slow uh, progressing disease. The normal pattern of insulin secretion is is disturbed. So there's two there's a, some phases in uh, insulin secretion. I'll get to that later. Uh, usually beta cell dysfunction is progressive, usually over time it uh, gets, gets worse. So how I like to explain it to my patients is, think about retirement. We all want to retire, right? It's a far off dream that we have of retirement. So beta, in type 2 diabetes, it's, your beta cells are kind of slowly retiring. That's kind of how I explain it to them. You know, they're slowly making less insulin, it's not your fault. You want to retire too, right? Because usually the patients that we talk to are pretty old. And uh, yeah, then, and then I explained it to it that way. And then it kind of lessens the blow because, you know, this, this is progressive. This disease is going to get worse. So, you know, we've got a lot of different practitioners here. Uh, what are some ways that you guys have talked to your patients about beta cell dysfunction? Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah. but I'm kind of sure that it has the 
the time period is hiring out as the resistance increases. Okay. Okay. So like the pancreas tires out and as there's more and more resistance. Yes. Okay. Could I get maybe one more volunteer to kind of chat about how they describe in uh, beta cell dysfunction to progressive beta cell dysfunction to their patients? One more brave volunteer. <laughs> like you're gonna have to. Like in it's your people with type two diabetes. If you put them on medication, eventually they'll probably need more. So how are you going to explain this to them? I yeah. Well, I can't tell them that. Have you ever put like a, a rotten piece of fruit next to a basket? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like and a bad strawberry. Yeah. Exactly. They all yeah. kind of feel bad. Okay. That's okay. that's reasonable. Because I'm a dietitian, so I know it's good. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just for the people at home, that, that was a dietitian example. How you know if you have one, if you have a basket of fruit and one of the apples start, starts rotting, it kind of eventually spreads to the rest of them. <laughs> That's good. Okay. So let's see here. So there is, a, there is a big genetic factor in type 2 diabetes. So often if your parents have diabetes, it's something to, you know, that's often passed on to kids, so they have to know about it as well. Yeah. And um, unlike type 1 diabetes, where you know there's really nothing you can do to prevent it, a type 2 diabetes has lots of stuff you can do. There's diet factors, lifestyle factors, ex exercising, losing weight, starting metformin. Uh, all of those things can prevent the progression from pre-diabetes to full-blown diabetes. All right. So here's just a little fancy graph of that. Uh, so people for at risk of diabetes slowly, their insulin resistance goes up. And then at first, their pancreas will compensate and start producing way um, additional insulin. Uh, yeah, that's their sugar. So the postprandial starts to creep up first and their fats and sugars start to go up. Eventually though, your beta, the, those beta cells give up, they start failing, and then their insulin secretion is, is, uh, goes down while insulin resistance stays high. And then with your sugars, you can see that both postprandial sugars and fasting sugars go up. Cool. Okay, whoa. I forgot I put that in there. <laughs> okay, so uh, this, is a, this is a graph of uh, beta cell function. And you can see that, you know, even 10, 12 years before diagnosis, people will start getting impaired glucose tolerance and just postprandial hyperglycemia, then you have to get diagnosis. And then that, so that dysfunction is going down and down. Usually about diagnosis, 50% of beta cell function is lost. Uh, and usually beta cell function will continue to decline. And about 10 to 20% of beta cell dysfunction, you probably need insulin at that point. So that's what we're going to start talking about. Okay. So here's a sample question. So just take your time and then we'll kind of all go around and kind of vote on it. Okay, so let's go, let's, let's think about who says A, B, C, and D. Okay, good, yeah. So that is the correct answer. So let's go through and take a look at why, why each one is, is, is wrong. So why isn't A a likely candidate? He's young, he's a teenager. Obese. He's obese. obese, that's right. Morbidly. Morbidly obese. So that's right. So you could you could argue that okay, maybe there's this type one who's obese who's a teenager. But the question asks what's most likely. And on the on and on the test you won't be able to argue with them, like, hey, in this one percent situation, this answer could be right. The answer asks which one's most likely. So you just have to go for it. So that's right. People with uh, type one diabetes are usually 
at least my own patients, they're usually quite thin actually. They don't have a problem with insulin resistance, they have a problem with insulin secretion because their beta cells are all there. So uh, with increasing weight, usually that means there's quite a bit of insulin resistance here. Remember from our last uh, presentation, insulin is an anabolic hormone. It makes, makes you gain weight, it builds things from builds complex molecules from simpler molecules. So often, uh, people who have high, who are really, who are really uh, heavy, usually have insulin resistance. Yeah. Okay. So why is B not the right answer? Who so said that? Okay, good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, so APOB APO is a marker for lipids only. Yes. So it doesn't really have any, yes, yes. it has no bearing on type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Yeah, but that's right. You were, I, I heard it somewhere that someone said lipids. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, how about C? Why C wrong? They're young too. Yeah, because their pregnant is probably gestational. And so, yes. Zero is, I'll talk about C peptide in just a second, but the reason why is that C peptide is a marker of endogenous of your own insulin production. So if you have no C peptide, often it means you have no insulin production. So that's why D is the most likely. Of course, there's exceptions to every case, but on exam, you have to go with what's most likely. Okay. Hold down a little bit. Yes. Okay. So here's the amino acid sequence. So you don't have to memorize it, but it's if you can if you know the struct if you kind of understand the structure of it, then you don't have to memorize a whole bunch of stuff. So these individual amino acids, the glycine, the and stuff like that, uh, kind of think of it like uh, the string coming out, and these amino acids are like directions for folding. So you know how like in the origami you take this like a piece of paper and you fold it eventually into this nice paper crate. That's kind of what uh, insulin does as well. It's coming out. It's coming out of the cell as this as this kind of these. It's like a string of pearls. It's coming out of the cell, but these amino acids make it fold into like a particular pattern, so that when it's finished, it kind of looks like a paper crate that fits into the insulin receptor. Yeah. So here's a kind of a visual of that. Uh, in, you have insulin, it interacts with the insulin receptor, and then that allows glucose to get into the cell. Okay, what else did I want to say about this? Okay, so the, you have beta cells producing insulin, you have beta cells producing insulin right now as, as you eat your food, as you eat your food. And the shape, the, the amino acids direct the shape of the, of the key that it makes. And so for years, uh, people used the insulin of pigs and cows because the amino acid sequence is similar enough that it can kind of fit into, you know how like when you have a key that's a little bit rusty, but you can still kind of jam it into the lock and it's still a lock. That's kind of like using the insulin of like pigs and, and cows. It still works, but it's not, it's not great. Um, yeah, hypurin, which is a pork insulin, is still available. I think you can still order it on McKesson if anyone has looked, but I don't think anyone uses it anymore. Yeah, the vast majority of insulin now is just biosynthetic. It's made from yeast or bacteria. And uh, yeah. Okay. So Humulin R and Novel in Toronto was one of the first synthetic insulins made. And their amino acid chain is exactly is exactly this. So, which, but um, yeah, and I'll talk about it. The newer the newer uh, analogs have actually changed amino acids around, and so the shape is a little bit different. Enough enough to fit into the receptor, just like that pork insulin and the beef insulin. But uh, it does affect how fast or how short it works, and I'll explain how that works in a minute. Okay. Okay, so here's the structure of in insulin again. And this is C peptide. So C peptide is something that preserve remember how we talked about how insulin only has like a oh wait, no, I'm reviewing that later. So this C 
see how that extends the shelf shelf life of insulin. It's kind of like puts it in, in storage, kind of. Okay. And so when insulin's activated, you lose the C peptide, and then the insulin becomes active. So you need to to take off the C peptide before the insulin's active. That's why if you have no going back to that question. If you have no C peptide, that means you're probably not producing any insulin. So that's why D was the correct answer. Let's see here. Okay, yeah. So yeah, because because insulin is actually very easily chopped up into little pieces by all the enzymes in your body, especially the ones in your kidney. And so the, those kidney enzymes go around and kind of snip the bonds and break break the pearl back into its amino acids. And so that pearl insulin guards against that so that insulin can be stored for later use. Okay, every, cl every class usually asks me like, okay, should, so should we be checking C peptide levels for all our patients? And the answer is no, like that's not generally done in, in practice. Uh, and we, in, an, in a way we don't care, we don't, like we're, we care about the person's like glucose levels. That's what does the damage to the body. High hyperglycemia causes the damage to the eyes, the kidneys, the heart, the nerves. It's not C peptide levels that are doing any dam any damage. It's just kind of like a marker of maybe type one or type two. Okay. So here's a here's a picture of insulin production in the beta cell. Your ribosomes make insulin. It's stored in these vesic vesicles. Uh, that are high in zinc and low in pH. And eventually, when your sugar is high, your, your, beta cells, your beta cells, assuming it's healthy, respond in 60 to 120 seconds, secretes insulin, and uh, that gets into your bloodstream. And then eventually, the insulin is filtered out by your kidneys uh, or degraded by enzymes in your kidney, and then they get sick in our circulation at that point. Yeah. Okay. So let's review the last, let's review, do a little bit of review of our last presentation. See if you, see if you were paying attention to me last, see if you were paying attention to me last time. Okay, so for the first question, what's the answer? Good, that's right. That's why we don't go low, because uh, if, if say I, my pancreas accidentally created a huge bolus of insulin, in four minutes it's half that strength, and then another four minutes is quarter strain, and then in another four minutes is 12.5. So none of us are, that's why we don't go low, but our patients sometimes do. Um, oh, shoot, I, I kind of answered the next question. Okay, yeah, so it's four, <laughs> four to 18 minutes is the, is the next question. <laughs> that's good. Okay. How about this one? Okay, so let's let's go through this. Uh, so where you have to memorize this is Appendix 6 of the guidelines. You need, the, the Appendix 6 shows all the half-lives and onsets of actions and durations, and you probably have to know that on exam. I can guarantee you that there will be questions on insulin on the exam. So it's a probably a good idea to memorize that. So this is the answer, 25 hours. Okay. This, this one here is Novo Rap, Head of Fias. This one here is Humalog. This is Human R or, or Novel in Toronto. This one's NPH. And this one's Lebanese. Yeah. Uh, Lantis is usually a little bit longer. Uh, Lantis uh, usually lasts about 24 hours, closer to 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Where are this? You said appendix? Appendix 6 of the 2018 guidelines. Yeah. So memorize that part. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Any of the previous uh, steps? Previous, this one? Yeah. Okay. Sure. This will be on my website, so. <laughs> okay. 
So here's a question. Okay, here's a question for you. And I got well, I want you guys to figure this out. So I told you that human R in all in Toronto is the same amino acid sequence as the insulin that you're making right now. But the amino the insulin that you're making right now only lasts about four to eighteen whatever <coughs> four to eighteen minutes. But this one lasts six point five hours. So why is there such a big difference? The amino acid sequence is the same. Okay, good. That's that's one thing. Good. So, so subcutaneous injection that your your pancreas is secreting insulin right into the bloodstream, whereas the insulin that your patients are injecting they're forming a depot under the skin. So that's different. There's one other thing I want you guys to figure out. Hexamers. Good. Good. <laughs> good. Okay. So I'll get to those in just a second. So <laughs> insulin by itself has this tendency to form hexamers. So each of these different colors is a is a molecule of insulin. So notice it has like the, you know that kind of key like structure. So if in uh, let's see here, yeah, each color is a different molecule of insulin. Yeah. And when they're exposed to high zinc or low pH, they like to kind of cluster together. And when they're clustered together, they're really hard to degrade and they, they last long. Mm -hmm. But you need them to turn into monomers before they're active again. So by altering, by altering the amino acid structure, you can change how uh, insulin works. Mm -hmm. So for example, for Lantus, they put in a bunch of uh, different uh, amino acids so that it, they form hooks with one another. So that hexamer lasts longer. Uh, for stuff like uh, uh, Novorapin and Epidra and stuff like that, they have they they took out the uh, amino acid sequence that makes them clump together, and so they dissolve into monomers faster. That gets into your blood faster, and then it has a faster duration of action. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So here's an example of that. Uh, NPH forms these kind of like random clusters. Lantus forms these more stable and more uh, regular clusters that will eventually dissolve. Uh, yeah, they go these uh, kind of like monomers. Yeah. So here's a test question. Here's a sample test question. How much time am I taking? Six forty three. Okay, good. Any questions from the people online? Okay, so let's go through this. Um, who thinks A? How about B? Uh, C? D? Okay, so you, yeah, you got it. Just got it. Okay, so there we go. So why is going for a cold shower going to uh, make it work slower? Reduce the circulation, that's right. Yeah, all the recipes, soaking a hot tub, increase the circulation. Uh, doing bench press presses is a tricep exercise, so that will increase circulation. Going for full body massage increases circulation, so yeah. Also notice that on the exam, there's lots of these not questions, okay? And you have to watch out for them because they, they followed up a lot of my students before. So when, when there's a not question, just circle the not so that you remember, okay, it's asking for the opposite. What is this question really asking for? Yeah, what's, what's making, what will increase absorption, what will make it faster? It's not asking, like some people will get confused, oh, which one will make it go slower? So just watch for that on exam. There's lots and lots of not questions. Okay. Okay, here's another question. Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, I'll give you I'll give you a minute more. Just think about it, and then we'll do our survey. Okay. Okay. So let's go through this. How about who thinks A? Okay. B. E, C. D. E, okay. E. Okay. So some mixed answers, but yeah, the majority got it right. So let's go through this and figure this out. Okay. So why is using a 12 meter, millimeter needle? Why would that? So again, it's a not question. So what it's asking for is what will make TJ work faster. Okay. Uh, so why would using a 12 millimeter needle increase the speed of absorption? Intramuscular abduction. That's right. So here. So remember that uh, insulin is supposed to be given subcutaneously. All right. If it goes into, it is supposed to sit there, form hexamers and depots, and just sit there and then slowly, slowly break apart and slowly get into your bloodstream. If you get into muscle, there's a lot of different, the circulation there is much faster, the absorption is different depending on how active you are. It usually makes it more erratic, but generally it's a faster absorption. So that's why A is part of the answer. How about B? Why is it wrong? Yeah, you don't need to shake it. It's, it yeah, it won't do anything. Like, so that's why B is wrong. Um, remember that N H N P H and human N are cloudy insulins, as well, well like noble mix and stuff like that. And that's because of the protamine in there that needs to be the protamine stabilizes those hexamers. So that's why you need an even suspension. If you just injected, uh, if you just injected the clear part of human N, it'd be just like human R or Toronto. So it wouldn't have that long acting effect. <laughs> Uh, stomach instead of the usual buttocks area. Why is that right? It's more fat. <laughs> uh, yeah. Some people have fat in the stomach too. For whatever reason, the here we go. Yeah, the stomach is uh, absorbs the most fastest and consistently, whereas the buttocks is the slowest center of absorption. Yeah. So this is from the FIT guidelines. This is something else that's probably going to show up on exam. The FIT guidelines is the forum for injection technique. Um, it's useful to uh, discuss with your patients anyway. There's lots of great clues, of, you know, um, like if it's high dose, how to split it, or pediatrics, or someone who's really thin, how to give injections for that, or pediatrics, how to store insulin. So that's this is a that, that's a really really good information and probably on the exam anyway. So that's a fake guidelines. It has its own website and everything. Okay. Sorry, it's question? Fit guidelines. Fit guidelines, F I T, form for injection technique. Yeah. So that, that will probably show up on the exam as well. Yeah. Okay. Oh, here we go. Thank <laughs> you. 
Still, you guys still think, looks like you're still thinking about it, so I'll give you another minute. It's a good conversation. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, who thinks A? Okay, how about B? C? Okay, C. Uh, D? And E? So, yeah. So, it's either B or D. So, okay, why isn't it NPH? That's right. The, t the onset of NPH is what? No, the onset. The onset of NPH. Yeah, line T to like 120 minutes. So this is a bit too, he's taking it right at 10 o'clock. So that's a bit too early for that. It's more likely the, it's more likely the Pedra because the onset, the onset is faster. So why is it 10 instead of 18? Partially. Because he's having severe hypoglycemia. Yeah. So like, in so, in, two, yeah, exactly. Two units is not enough to yeah. prevent severe hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. Well, if he's having severe hypoglycemia, you want to be more cautious on the dose. So you want to reduce that further rather than rather than less. Mm -hmm. You know, you can always bump the pedra back up, but uh, if he has another low and has to go to the hospital, think about how terrible that is to experience. Yeah. yeah. The rule is reduced by 10%, correct? Of the yeah, there's no rule like that. There's no, there's, it, you can increase by 10%, but there's no rule if there's hypoglycemia, how much you decrease by. It's uh, kind of up to your clinical judgment. Yeah, so definitely more if he's having severe hypoglycemia. Question, yes, question. He's also taking the same amount of epidural, breakfast, so we'll think why not getting so he's take the sort of question is he's taking the same amount of Peter at breakfast and lunch mm -hmm. as well. So why isn't he getting hypoglycemia? Why do we need to reduce the supper time? Because so well, and so why do we only have to reduce the supper time? So he's only having hypoglycemia after supper. So maybe yeah, yeah maybe he's having really large lunches or really large mm -hmm. breakfasts or things like that. Um, there's no reason to decrease all of them if he's not having lows at any other time. He's only complaining about lows after supper. So that's why, so that's why we would reduce just the after supper one. Yeah. Does that make sense? I was okay. thinking along the line, like why would we choosing a big and not looking at a dog? Uh, on the exam, you, uh, like in real life, yeah, you have lots of different options. You think that, okay, supper is getting hypoglycemia, but mm -hmm. it's just that, yeah, it's yeah, but that happens often. Some people have like light suppers. Maybe he's only having a salad for supper, but having a regular, a regular lunch and stuff like that. So you. Are there options like excluding NPH so they can use? Yeah, you could maybe change some other instance around. But for the exam, I know there's lots of options. But on the exam, you have to choose the option that's presented in front of you. Yeah. Okay. Let me see here. Okay, so this is a timeline of insulin. So insulin was first invented in 1922 by Canadians Banting and Best. Uh, then they added codeine to it to make intermediate insulin. Uh, then glargine and betamir came along. And then there's some new long, next generation long acting insulin that I want to talk about today as well. Yeah, and so this is kind of like a timeline for that. Okay, so two of the newer insulins are Tugel, which is a, a concentrated form of lactis, actually. So you have, it lasts longer because it's concentrated, because there's a reduction in that surface area. So with less surface area, there's less circulation, and that makes and less uh, disassociation into mon monomers, and that makes it last longer. You can see here that Clarkine is a good insulin, but still has a bit of a peak, and then you 
because and then comes down, whereas uh, glar concentrated glargine lasts for longer. Uh, Trisipa is another one, it forms little monomers and it has a stable uh, duration of action as well. Yeah. Okay, I actually loaded this presentation with questions. All right, so let's go through this. Uh, so who says A? Uh, B, C, uh, D, or E? Okay, that's pretty. Okay, yeah. So uh, let's go through why each one is wrong. Um, so actually, here I'll share this slide first. So generally, if you're going switching from one daily to one daily, it's one to one. But if you're going from PI, PID or twice daily, then you decrease by twenty percent. So looking at this, going from twice daily one to one to Levermere is wrong because you didn't reduce it twenty percent. Uh, when you come, when you kind of combine into one dose, we're worried about hypoglycemia. And so we want to just reduce the risk of hypoglycemia for our patients. You can always bump it back up. But if you if you start to, if you you know spend all your time convincing your patient to switch to a new insulin and then they go low on it, they're likely not going to come back to you or listen to any other advice that you have. So it's better to be safer rather than to, to be sorry. Okay, why is the Toronto insulin question off? So, yeah, exactly. It's you're just changing, yeah, it's, well, I guess technically you're right, you're going from PID to once daily, but uh, it's intermediate. Yeah, yeah, that's right, I'm saying to a long acting analog, that's why, good. I knew there was, I knew there was backup in my, just backups in my question to make sure that I'm right. Uh, basic law, again, you didn't reduce it by 20%, cumulative and you're cutting the dose in half. And then to jail, we actually reduced to twenty percent. So some questions over here. Yeah. So if it would have been eleven minutes, that was a, that's not good. But it's forty-eight okay. units at bedtime. Yes. Either of them, then it could be also an answer, right? So it was quite. What? So if eleven minutes was there, but yeah. it says forty-eight units at bedtime, yeah, and it could be also one of the answers. If yeah, like if it's a long acting, as long as you're, if you're going from a DID to a long acting analog and you reduce it by 20%, then that could be a correct answer as well. If, and you could put it in the morning or the evening. And yeah, it, should, it shouldn't matter over the long term. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any questions over there? Any questions over there? No? I was just discussing the difference between the short and the. Uh, what are the short insulins and what are the rapid ones? Short insulins and rapid insulins, yes. sure. So the short insulins so are Cumulin R yeah. and Toronto. Is, that's right, right? Yes. Yeah. Cumulin yeah. R. Cumulin R. Is rapid. That's right. Cumulin yeah. log is rapid because yeah. it has. And a yeah. And a Pedra. And over rapid yeah. and PS. Yeah. yeah. A Pedra and PS. So. Yeah, it's short acting. It's short acting. So the human, human are. Yeah. Yes. I think what you mean is one human of R or human of R. Uh, I think so. Go back to the for the. The six point four hours. The six point five. Sure. How about can we do that after the presentation? Yeah. 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 So remember, with human R and uh, Toronto. Those are the actual amino acid sequence. Where, so that's uh, fast acting insulin. So rapid acting insulin is, are, they're analogs. They're designed so that they split, they split apart from the hexamers really quickly. They, so their amino acid sequence has been changed. That's why they act so much faster than human R and Toronto. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, question. A practical question. Practical question. Be, Good. Um, if you're going from BRD to PD, when mm -hmm. would you tell them to take their next dose? So say. Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so say you have someone who's NPH 30, morning, evening, and then you're switching them to lanterns or something like that. Um, it kind of depends on how high their sugars are. This, this won't be an example. What I do is that, say, uh, how do I do it? Oh, yeah, okay. So 30 in the morning, 30 in the evening. Say I want them to take lanterns in the evening or something like that. I'll say, okay, take like 15 in the morning and then take the full dose of Lantus at night. That's how, that's, depending on, if the sugars are high, I might do the full 30. Um, but, or, but if your sugars are quite on target, I'll be able to 15. There's no right answer for that. That's, that's just what I do. And if, if you wanted to say, can you cut it by like, morning, maybe some high for a day? Yeah, if there's just high for a day, it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Lantus will start kicking in the evening and then they can take it every evening. That's just what I do. There's no right answer for that. Like, don't quote me wrong. Not or anything no, like that. Yeah, just a, just a practice thing. And I don't, I don't think anyone has like a real answer to that. Right. Yeah. Switching and, and all that has not, like, we know the protocol, but it's not been studied in terms of switching patients from one to the other and what is the right recipe. I think it's a clinical experience. Yeah, it's totally reliant on your clinical yes. experience. Um, yeah. Okay, what was I talking about? Yeah, th but that's a great question. Thanks for that. Because I love it when you make it practical, because then you can actually go home and, okay, I have this patient next day that I have to do, and that's what, 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 so it's just an option for you. Cool. Thank you. Okay, next, next, let's go next. Okay, so BID. Wow, I added a lot of questions for this, this one. Um, okay, one wrap. Okay, we'll do one more question here. I don't think I'll be able to finish today, but I can. We're we're doing another pres presentation of Veronica in April thirtieth. April thirtieth. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So I'll continue where I left off sure. here. I'll probably end it pretty soon. I would just want to save some time for you to ask questions at the end and stuff like that. Sorry. I'm only on slide 30 of 50, so I know. So I, I, I don't think I can get through the rest of this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so who says A? Okay, B, C, D. Okay, good. Most of you got it. So remember, okay, this is an accept question, so it's like a not. So what is it really asking for? No, like what is the question? What, what is false? What often is wrong? It's not asking for true. Which one's wrong? So trembling and dizziness are associated with hypoglycemia. That are cerebral symptoms. Uh, usually, hypoglycemia is is below four, but not all patients are aware that they experience hypoglycemia. Um, I've got lots of patients. Well, I've got one patient. Uh, well, I've got lots of patients with hypoglycemia and awareness. The worst one was like this young girl, maybe twenty one ish or something like that. But she would just like go into the wash. She would go into washrooms, then she would wake up and there'd be all these people like on top of her with like ambulances and stuff like that. Yeah, she would get like zero. Uh, warning symptoms of hypoglycemia. Yeah. Question. Okay, so that's a, that's an excellent question. So for the people at home, the question was, does hypoglycemia happen in the early course or the later course? So um, how do I explain this? For the warning signs. Like the warning signs. Oh, the hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia and awareness. Yeah. yeah. So hypoglycemia and awareness is related to the counter-regulatory hormones, like kind of like the glucagon and, and epinephrine that I was talking to before. So if those are impaired, then because glucagon causes you to feel nauseated and, and dizzy and stuff like that, and epinephrine causes you to feel nervous and shaky and things like that. Um, 
those are the, those are the autonomic symptoms, and then we'll get into neuroglycopenic symptoms later. But if you so if you don't have those uh, epinephrine and glucagon responses, then you don't get any signs, and then you just faint. And so for so uh, those counterrespiratory hormones are made by alpha cells, which are co-located with the beta cells. So usually when you have beta cell dysfunction, the alpha cells will follow with dysfunction. So people of type one usually have worse hypoglycemia and awareness because their alpha cells are not communicating with beta cells because they're not there anymore, then they die off as well. Whereas with type two, usually at the beginning when their healthy, when their beta cells are still okay, they're still, their, their alpha cells are still okay. But further down the road, when they've got a long-standing diabetes, their alpha cells die out as well, and then they don't have those hormones. Yeah, but that is an excellent question. Thank you. Oh, and we have a question from the is audience. It, is, it, oh, yeah. is it like particularly because of the deficient alpha cells, or is it because um, the body gets used to adapting itself to the alarming signs? And the patient is going to have a Let's say, let's do a simple analogy. Yeah. Let's say for DM2 that um, we have a sensor in our body yeah. that senses the drop in the blood glucose level. Yeah. Then the counter glucose will just pump, mm -hmm. and then we'll kill the symptoms. And by the time that sensor gets more blunt or more insensitive, by the time, mm -hmm. like uh, our body, like our sensation of the shakiness and trembling and those kind of things will get like mm -hmm. higher pressure we're getting used to it we don't feel it anymore it's mm -hmm. something late more developed so our central nervous system response to the counter um so here here i'll i'll, I'll discuss it okay so there's i think that the alarm i think is okay the pop the sensing part is okay so think of it like a fire alarm. The, the, it's something senses smoke, and then the water comes down and puts out the smoke. I think that the sensor is okay, but there's no the water mechanism to come down is what's faulty because glucagon causes these uh, hypoglycemic symptoms. So that's does that does that make sense? Like, I think your body can sense that your sugars are low, but because it can't produce any glucagon or hypoglycemia, there's no warning bell like. The body knows something is wrong, but because it can't produce those hormones, there's no bell to warn people, there's no water coming down, there's no sound to alert people. Does that make sense? Okay. And sure, oh, I've got a question from the audience. Um, someone asked me, oh, really? Do I have a question from the audience? Oh, it's just, oh, sorry, it's just blinking. Okay, sorry, uh, your question? Um, explain where Symptoms of hypoglycemia occur in a patient who has high sugar, okay. and then it just drops mm -hmm. uh, to what is, these are normal levels, so these are normal levels. Yeah. So let's talk about, let's go back to that uh, fire alarm analogy. So let's say that you, sometimes your body can get used to high sugars, and when your body senses that drop, even the, in a normal, if it, their sugars are normal, that would go too low. So once the sensor set drops, it panics, and then it sends out the water, but there's no fire. It's too, it's like, it's like oversensitive. Like you maybe just making a little bit of toast, and but that little bit of toast sends, trips the wire, and then all this water comes down. Uh, yeah, pseudo, pseudo hypoglycemia is the name for that. And so how you treat that is you just have to be really patient and slowly bring the sugars down so that your body kind of gets used to the, to the lower sugars. And then eventually that will go away by itself. Okay. Um, in practical terms, it depends on the, uh, yeah. It, for me, how I would do it is that I would say, okay, you know, I know, I would acknowledge their fears first of all, because I think as healthcare professionals, it's important to acknowledge the patient's fear. Then I'll just do it really slowly. I'll go like one unit a week or something like that. Just to, they're, they're probably, their A1C will not be a target in three to six months, but you gain the trust of your patient by going really slowly, maybe even choose slowly if you notice anything. And uh, eventually you will get to a dose where the triggers are going to come down. Something like that. Like I would negotiate something that the patient is very comfortable with. 
Yeah. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, so here we can talk about it. If you've got a specific case, maybe we can talk about it afterwards or more specifically. There's the internet argument that it's more uncomfortable not keeping on the hospitals. It's really hard. Because of the fear of the Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And it's not really that related to telling me no, that's her model, not everybody else's model, but that's the personal model. Mm -hmm. She's very fearful of that's the yeah, uh, like that's that's common, and I, and I think that you know we've never passed it from hyperglycemia, so we we don't know how scary it is to like just wake up and have like all these EMS people putting needles into you. So you know that is that is scary. I would kind of acknowledge that acknowledge your fears, I, but I would kind of talk about hey, if your sugars are too high, you'll run into these consequences later with your heart and your eyes and your and your kidneys and your feet, you know, I understand that you're afraid. Can we meet halfway and do an insulin increase of X per week or something like that? That's kind of how I would approach it. Yeah, some sort of negotiation where they feel comfortable, but you, you're like, okay, good, I'm getting the patient eventually to target. Yeah, yeah, is that, is that a reasonable answer? Okay. So here, I'm going to end with this next slide then because I'm kind of out of time. Um, yeah, so C is answer. Okay, so uh, to show there's a reduction in volume. As you can see, there's one curve that's volume, but the same amount of insulin. And this just shows the blood group. So this, the blues with just uh, regular dose, regular concentration of IV, and this black is with uh, with, with, with uh, concentrated IV. So you can see that there's a much smoother infusion rate, and the blood glucose levels stay much, much more stable. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think I'll end it there for today, and uh, we'll pick up. On April 20th? 30th. 30th, 30th. I'm bad at dates. April 30th. <laughs> it's, on, it's on the books. It's on the books. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Any kind of uh, questions from anything we've talked about today? And which is something about the Zen and pH? I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll get to So, zinc and pH make hexamers more, they stimulate the insulin to form hexamers. So, for example, with uh, Degludec, their formulation is a high zinc and high phenol, uh, form, like the solution is in. That makes, and yeah, and that makes it forms those monomers and stuff like that. So as the zinc and phenol disassociate, those, those, those chains break apart and then that forms monomers and that's why the that insulin works so well. Yeah. That's how they make it stronger. That's right, yeah. Any other questions, concerns? Okay, so I'll be I'll be around still to answer like individual <laughs> cases and stuff like that. Feel free to chat amongst yourself. You're all writing exams. So you might as well get to know one another and try to help one another out. Um, I'd like to thank Veronica again for 